Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five-string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. This is Patrick McWilliams again. I'm uh, back. I'm going to be talking about Junior. Now, I brought this up in the last story that I guess it was episode 51. To bring this up to speed now, Mike was actually invited down to Lanthrop State Park. They were going to do like this first Bigfoot speech thing down there and i was like well this is cool so he wanted everybody to show up for this so he called everybody in sir and i still wasn't part of sir yet he said you know if you want to go you know i'd love to have you i said okay so i grabbed my camera and all my camping stuff loaded it up into my honda element and we all went down this was in i want to say late june early july of 2016 and as we were going down there, we were looking for a place to camp. And everywhere that Mike looked on these maps, he kept pointing out areas. I was like, we can go here, we can go here, we can go here. And every place we looked down south, we couldn't find anything. It was just, there were homes everywhere. And like homes have sprung up all over Colorado. So we start looking around, we find a place that is kind of nestled back in this big open valley. There are homes in the valley, but there's like this big, weird open space. And he said, let's try this spot. And so we all ended up at this one location. There's a dirt road that heads straight up into the mountains, right outside of our campsite. And then there's another dirt road that heads, let's see, the, the road that heads straight past us into the mountains is heading east. And the other side, it's heading due north. So we pull in, we get our stuff roughly set. I'm going to be camping in my car. I'm not sleeping in Mike's tent. And he has an outfitter's tent. So his tent is pretty big. It's like 15 feet long by about 10 feet wide and nine feet in height. It looks like a big white house. It's got a window in the back and big front door or a big flap type of uh, door entrance. Everybody basically set up their stuff inside his tent. And he said, I would love to have you, you know, stay in my tent, but you're still new here. We're not going to really let you into this area yet until we're used to you. I said, that's fine. I don't care. So we ended up driving down to Lanthrop and Mike did his uh, speech down there and people were asking us all kinds of questions about Sasquatch. And then we ended up driving back. Now, Mike's son Trenton brought a friend named Zach and he left his cell phone back at Lanthrop. So he came out as we were finishing up dinner and he said, hey, Mike, I left my cell phone back at the amphitheater. So they took off and they went as fast as they could back to uh, the state park. In the meantime, I was outside photographing all kinds of things. I was looking at the mountains across from us and there was this weird storm that was going on. Lightning was flashing and everything. And it was a standalone cloud. It was really kind of strange, but it was just left of this mountain peak. And I was taking pictures of that. As the darkness really started to come into play, you could see the Milky Way extending up and over this peak, and it went all over, all the way across us. You could see it curve off and go off into the distance, and I thought, that is pretty wickedly cool. So I was photographing that. We found spiny lizards on the ground. We were taking pictures of those guys. Eventually, everybody started to wean off, and they were going to go into the tent and start to get ready to go to sleep. So I pack up my camera gear and I move it to the back of my car. And so I'm still photographing things. And I figured I'm not going to go to sleep until Mike shows up. So I'm just going to sit out here. So I'm filming this guy and it's pretty dark outside. There is another camper and the camper is, he's got one of those big metal, I can't think of it. It's a big metal type of camper. And he's about 50 yards from us and he's you know keeping to himself. And as the dark falls, I can't really see that camper anymore. But I start to hear somebody walking down the road. And I thought, well, who's walking behind me? So I take a picture and as the camera's going through its process, 
I walk away from the camera and I start walking into the darkness thinking that I'm going to run into the sky because everybody else that I'm aware of is inside that tent. Now there is two other people. Now there's Dave Odke and his grandson and they're in a tent right behind Mike's tent. They're butted up against the back part of Mike's tent. They're sitting there. They're just kind of talking back and forth and I'm walking into the darkness and I'm looking around and I turn on my headlamp and I don't see anybody. I'm looking as far as I can, which is about 30 feet. And I'm looking around and I was like, geez, I just don't see anything. So I walk back. And as I get to the camera, I hear these footsteps again and they're coming back. They're coming towards me. And I'm like, where are you at? So I turn and I walk. Now we are kind of in a big open valley. The grass is about anywhere from a few inches in height to about maybe two feet in height. There are sporadic trees. There's more scrub oak than anything in the area. And there's like these scrub oak shrubs that are about six, seven feet in height. They're kind of deep, you know, here and there, like you can walk through them, but it makes too much noise as you're kind of wandering through it. I'm hearing whatever it is coming down and I keep walking back to it. And I'm like, where are you at? And I keep asking, hello, is there somebody there? Is there somebody here? You know, I'm expecting to hear, yeah, I'm, I'm needing something. But I don't hear a response from anybody. So I go walking back to my camera and I turn on the, I take another shot. I'm listening and whatever this is, is now turned and walked into the grass. And as it's walking, I can hear the crunching of leaves. And I'm like, all right, well, this is somebody. I can clearly hear that somebody's back here. So I go walking back in there and I start going around the shrubs and stuff. I'm starting to think that it's Trenton because Trenton and I are, we've kind of built up this unique rapport and we like messing with each other. And so I'm like, all right, that kid is trying to scare me or something. So I try to spook him out. And again, every time I get close to that sound, it stops and I cannot find what it is. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go back and look at that tent. And so I go back and towards Mike's tent, the light's still on inside the tent. And I, as I come around, I'm thinking Trenton's not going to be there. And he's there. He's asleep. He's got his earbuds in. He's sound asleep. Everybody in that tent is pretty much sound asleep but the light's still on in the tent. So I went ahead and walked back, set my camera up, was taking more pictures. And I was like, you know, this is really kind of strange. So Dave Otke, he's laying in his tent. He starts to hear someone walking around his tent. And he's like, hello, hello. Even his grandson is like, hey, who's out there? You know, and I can hear him talking. So I go walking towards him. I said, are you guys hearing something walk? And they said, yeah. And they said, it's walking right near us. And I was like, I've been looking for whatever this is for the past 20 minutes. I can't figure out where this is at. And I'm wandering around. Now I'm wandering you know, around their area trying to figure out if there's something out here. I said, I don't see it. I don't understand what this is. And he said, well, maybe it's something else. I said, I guess it could be. So I go back to my car and I'm just saying, okay, you know what? I'm pretty much done. I think I'm going to start putting my stuff away. About that time, I hear a truck coming down the road, and it is flying. And I see this truck go by, shoom, and I was like, well, there goes Mike. And then he goes flying on down the road, and he said, well, he just missed the turn. And he goes for probably about 100 yards, and I hear him lock up, and the truck slides a bit. And I was like, oh, I wonder what he's seeing. Well, he and Zach notice I shine as they were coming down the road. They see something crossing the road, and it looks at them, and then they see I shine. They stopped, turn off the lights, and they watched this thing move across the road. But they couldn't see the body. They just saw the, the eyes and the rough silhouettes going across the road. So he's like, wow, look at that. You know, that's eye shine. And Zach was getting into it like, wow, that's pretty cool. As they're watching that, I am back in my car, putting my camera away, putting my tripod away. I closed the tailgate and the, and the hatch on the Honda Element. And I open up the passenger door and the suicide door, because that's how I'm going to be getting into my my sleeping area. As I'm stepping up into the car, I hear, and this voice just goes. <laughs> I'm sitting there looking into the darkness going, that's right where those footsteps were. I said, what is down there? And this yell goes on easily for like 40 seconds. I was like, there's no way. And I just sat there up on my car, just listening to this. I have no recording equipment out. I've got nothing to capture that. I was like, oh, this is just not right. And he yells. And once his yelling stops, if you put a pin on Google Earth right where we were located and drew a circumference around us, I'd say about 40 yards out all the way around us, you would hear coyotes in a complete circle going all the way around our campsite. And I was like, 
oh my God, they're close. And I just sat there listening, looking in the complete circle as these coyotes are sounding off. And I was like, that's crazy. Well, Mike, as they're sitting down there, they're looking at, they got their windows down and they're listening for stuff. He hears the coyotes going off, sounding off by the camp. And he's like, oh, we got to go back there. There's coyotes over by the campsite. So they turn around and they drive back as fast as they can to get to where I'm at. I'm sitting there just listening. I hear him coming back up the road. The closer he gets, the quieter the coyotes get. And eventually they just quit. And he pulls in and goes, were there coyotes sounding off? I went, oh, yeah. They were all the way around our campsite. It was crazy. But there was a vocal that went off of a guy screaming way down this, this road. And he's like, really? And I said, Mike, I've been hearing things walking around this campsite all night. I've been looking for him. They've actually heard him. We don't know what it is. And he's like, oh, that's crazy. He goes, well, we saw eyes shining down the road. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I said, well, then I guess this is a good spot. And he goes, yeah, it is. And he goes, well, we're going to go inside. And Zach ran inside the tent and he climbed into his cot. Mike went in and he came back in and goes, has this light been on all night? And I said, yeah. And he's like, oh, he went in and he turned off the light, zipped his tent closed. And I ended up climbing into my car, closing everything up. And I hit the button to lock it down. All my windows on my car are blocked. And so nothing can look inside. Nothing can see inside. Nobody can peer in because I got this stuff put up on all the windows. The only window I don't have blocked is my skylight. And that's right above my head. So I crack that open so I can get air to, you know, to come in and feel comfortable inside the car. So as I'm laying there and it's quiet and everything's getting all calmed down, I start to hear footsteps coming down the road again. And I'm like, oh, not again. And <laughs> this thing comes down, walks past me. I can hear it walking right by me. No grunting, no sounds, no nothing. It's just walking. Walks alongside the right side of Mike's tent. And I was walking past Dave Otke and Dave goes, Patrick, is that you? I'm in my tent or in my car. I don't hear him. And this thing stops. He goes, hello. Hello. Is there somebody there? And they sat and they waited like, why isn't he talking? Goes, I don't know. And this thing starts up, starts walking away again and walks right into, you know, deeper, deeper into the background of everything. So eventually they don't hear it and they eventually go to sleep. So I get up in the morning and I hear someone milling around at the campsite and I'm like, all right. So I peek outside and I see it. It's Jim. And I'm like, oh, all right. So I get dressed and I get out of my car, grab my gear, I grab my camera. I leave my tripod in the car. Basically I leave my car wide open just to air it out. I go over and talk to Jim about it. I said, did you hear the vocal last night? And he goes, there was a vocal. And I went, yeah. And he goes, no, I always miss those things. And I said, yeah, there was a long vocal. There was all kinds of coyotes sounding off. Mike heard it. Why well, he heard the coyotes he didn't hear the vocal and he's like oh but he said he saw ice shine down the road last night with uh yeah with zach he's like well that's cool i gotta talk to him about that and i said yeah i said you know i'm gonna go on to this road that's out here and i'm gonna walk down to the end because on google earth it looks like it comes to an end i want to see what's down there he's like okay so i grab my gear and or my camera and i go walking down the road the first thing i come across are these spiders and these spiders are weird because there's no hair on them. And they are, I would say, almost the size, if not longer than a tarantula. And there are thousands of these spiders. And they're all doing the same thing. They're all digging into the ground and pushing out earth. And I'm just like, what are you guys all doing? They're weird looking because they're hairless. Their bodies are kind of this pale gray. They've got a little bit of red around their, I guess they call them mandibles. They got weird little front arms. And the front arms, Unlike most spiders where they have, they come to a normal point. These things look like they've been cut off and replaced with like boxing gloves. They're weird looking. And I was like, what a strange looking spider. So I got down on my knees and I turned on the macro setting on my camera and I got close to this one. And as I got the camera down, he came charging out of that hole. If you look at a baseball, that's the size of hole that he's making in the ground. Now, they're not going very deep in. They're, it looks like they're digging in about a foot, and they're pushing out all this dirt. And I was like, why are you doing that? That's weird. But all these spiders, this entire colony, are doing the exact same thing. They're digging in before the sun comes up, and they're pushing out the earth. And I was like, that's so weird. So I'm going to kind of stop this for a second j just to talk about the spider. So this spider, I did research on it, and it turns out that it's protected by Colorado. It has two names. One name is called a barber spider, and the other one is called the spawn of Satan. <laughs> so the barber side of it 
is exactly what it sounds. This spider will come and seek you out. It will not bite you. It will not inject venom into you. It will not cause severe pain unless you're poking it with your finger. What it will do is it will come to you as you're sleeping, as your hair is laying out, it will trim your hair. It will literally cut your hair, like give you a nice haircut, but it probably won't look very nice. It'll look like maybe your boyfriend or husband or kids did it to you on purpose. They don't know what it does with the hair. They think that it either eats the hair or it beds in it, and they still haven't figured out. At the Natural History Museum, they're the ones that are kind of researching the spider. The other term, the spine of Satan, kind of makes a lot of sense. So this spider has some crazy features, like it can run up to 10 miles per hour and up to 10 miles in a city. Like if it needs to go 10 miles away, it will make that journey 10 miles from where it was last sitting. It can also, because of those weird boxing glove appendages that are in the front of it, it can scale things like glass, metal, slick surfaces. When it comes up to, say, a cot, or like if you capture it in a glass, you're like, ha you can't get out of that. Well, what they do is they secrete some type of goo or ointment into those boxing glove things, and they will proceed to smash them against the, the glass or the metal and lift their body weight with those two arms. And they will do that as they're climbing out of it or climbing up to get to your hair on your cot or wherever you may be. So there is no good hiding place you know, to save yourself unless you put your hair in some type of bag or something to protect yourself at night. These spiders are in and around the southwestern area of Colorado, and they're all around in those areas. The Natural History Museum in Denver is always looking for where these guys are at because they migrate so much. But you never find them really in the daylight because they can't be around sunlight and they die in, in sunlight. So I think that's also where they get the term spot of Satan. I think there's like six or 10 other names that this spider has. The ones that I was looking at were the thickness of a brat, and they were about five inches in length. And if you looked at the legs and if you sprawled them out, it'd be like a tarantula. It was just crazy looking spider. So I eventually left those spiders alone. And after taking my pictures and looking at them, I wandered on down the road. As I'm going down, I'm, I'm looking at aspens that have died and they've got some fungus on them. And I thought that was kind of strange because those trees also had spider webs on it. And I thought that was really kind of weird because those spider webs, I couldn't find spiders, but the spiders that I found where I was at don't produce webs. They don't produce any form of spider webs. So I thought that was also strange that here you have two different spiders that maybe these guys ate them. I have no idea. So I go walking down and I come across this ATV trail and an ATV trail goes north to south and I'm heading east on this on this road. So I look it down to the north, I look down to the, the south and I was like, I'll, I'll look at these in a bit. So I walked further on down to the end of this road and I discovered that this is just a dumping site for people who don't want to carry their trash out from the localized parks. I thought, all right, how kind of depressing here. So I turn around and I start walking back and I get back to the ATV trail and I take a right and I'm heading north on this trail. So I go up at about 15, 20 feet. I don't feel anything. I still hear the birds chirping and carrying on. And I can see that this trail goes on forever. I'm just like, no, I don't want to walk that. So I turn and go back down. And just as I cross the line to to step onto the south side of that trail, I get that creeped out sensation like I shouldn't be there. And it is pretty predominant. I walk in about 10 to 12 feet and I stop. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. The sensation I'm getting is get out. You don't belong here. Get out. And I was like, wow, this is strange. And I got my left hand holding the camera. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a picture. (laughs) So I turn it on. I go through the settings. I aim the camera up and I take one shot. Click. I was like, okay, that should be good. And I thought, you know what? I should turn around, but I'm not going to. I'm going to walk another five or six feet. And as I walk further down this trail, I stop at one spot and I'm kind of near this boulder and there's a whole bunch of pine trees next to me to my left. And it's kind of thick and everything to my right is just all grass. I'm like, wow, this is a little creepier. And I start to hear breathing and the breathing is coming on my left side of my face. And it literally sounds like this. (laughs) 
And I was like, wow, that's really creepy. I is something I did not expect to hear. And I can feel the breath, you know, coming and hitting my cheek. And I'm like, wow, they're, they're really close. This is just a little bit too close. Okay. And it wasn't like big man, you know, where he was looking down at me. This is something else. And it's looking straight at me to my left. And I got the sensation that they're right here because I, A, I can feel them breathing. I'm getting that overwhelming sensation. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to take one more photograph. <laughs> so I pulled the camera up and I just do a quick shot. I'm not even really paying attention to what I'm shooting. I'm just shooting. And I'm thinking, okay, if I turn to my left, I'm going to be face to face with this. And I'm going to be within inches of this face. Do I want to do that? And I thought, oh, I don't know if I should do this because I am overstepping a lot of boundaries right here. All right. So I ended up turning to my right. And it's something else I should not have done. I should have looked to my left. But I turned to my right and I started walking away. And I was thinking about, I should not have done this. I should have just backed up. But when I turned and I walked out, I really started thinking about this tiger at the aquarium. When I used to volunteer at the aquarium, I would really literally play with Malu, our Sumatran tiger. She would wait for me. She would hide up high and wait for either myself or Fee Brown to show up. All the trainers in the world could not get that cat to come down. But either Fee or I could get that cat to come down every time. And I knew if I turn my back, that's a simple sign that I can be jumped anytime, especially from wildlife. And you always want to face them off. So for me to turn to my right and walk out of there really set a weird standard for me because usually I don't do that. But whatever this was, was really showing dominance that I should not be there. Once I stepped out of that area and I walked onto the road, that sensation quit. I didn't have any more problems. I had no more issues. I had that feeling went away. I got relaxed and I was looking back down that trail. I didn't see anything looking at me down that trail. I didn't see anything that looked out of sort down that trail. And I was like, that's weird. So I turned and I started walking back to camp. I can't see the camp from where I'm at. I'm at least 200 yards from the campsite. So I'm walking back down this road. It takes me about, oh God, about 30 minutes to get to the campsite. As I'm walking down, I hear what sounds like a kid. And the kid is running, like it's trying to catch up to me. It's jumping over like logs and stuff. And it really sounds like a child running. So every time I'd start to turn my head to the left to look to see what this is, it stops. It slides, it drops to the ground, whatever it's doing. And I look over and I don't see him. I don't see this kid. I'm looking around. I can see pretty good distance. I'm looking down, looking all around that area, looking for a child and I, I don't see him. So I start walking back down and I start walking towards the campsite again. And again, I hear this kid running up and I'm like, where are you at? Every time I turn, I look, I don't see him. I'm taking my camera, I'm zooming in, I'm carefully scanning the grass to see if I can see a little head, something, nothing. I don't see this kid. I'm like, oh, this is annoying me. So I keep walking down. I eventually get back. I can see Jim uh, making breakfast and I come walking up. I talk to him. I said, dude, I think I'm being followed. And he goes, by what? I said, sounds like a child. So I put down my camera. I'm looking down that road. And I said, he was down. He was like running along the fence line. Then I noticed that the camper guy is no longer there. I said, when did the camper guy go? And he goes, I don't know. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> we don't know if he left because of the scream or what it was, but he is no longer there. His camper was gone and had no signs of him. But I was like, all right, my back is to Mike's tent. I put the camera to my right. It's on a small table, which is out of reach of me. I'm talking to Jim and he turns, he's facing me. We're just talking about stuff. And I look to my left past him and there are these pine trees. The way they had them growing, it was like almost like four trees back. They're all trimmed up about maybe five feet in height. And then the trees go up like another five, six feet in the air. And there's like a row of like six. So six feet of pine trees. And then there's like another row behind that, another row behind that, another row behind that. And I was like, that's a kid. And I'm looking at, at the very back row, there's a kid standing with his legs a little spread and he's got his right hand holding onto the pine tree trunk. He's holding onto the trunk itself. And his hairdo is weird. His hair, I can't see facial features. I can't see body features. I can't tell if this is a boy or a girl. I can tell that there is no clothing on this kid. I can see that there's hair on his arms and on his sides and on his legs and around his head because he's backlit. So the sun is coming up from the east and it's blasting him 
So all I see is dark shadows in that one spot, but I can see this kid. I can make him out. And I was like, Jim, where's my camera? <laughs> and Jim said, it's to your right. And I said, well, can you give it to me? And he goes, no. I said, get it yourself. And I said, why can't you pick up the camera and give it to me? And he said, because I'm busy. And I was like, oh. I'm looking at a kid. If you turn around, you can tell me if that's a kid or not. He's like, I'm not going to look. I'm too busy. I'm like, oh, I was like, okay, fine. So the minute I turn and I grab the camera and I look back, he's gone that quick. I'm like, oh, so I go grab the camera. I go running out through those trees. And he said, what do you see? And I looked down the fence line from where he came from. I said, you can see where he stood through the grass. And you can see how he were each step or each area that he stepped in which it seemed like it was like almost a three foot distance that he went from step to step to step to step, got to the tree. You can see where he planted his feet. And I said, dude, he was standing right here. Like he was doing this number. And I kind of demonstrated it. And he's like, where'd he go? And I looked to my left and he could see where he went. And I said, well, he went this direction. And he goes, well, follow it. I went after him, got to the, there's like a, an area where it drops down to the road. And there's like this kind of a washout area where the rainwaters and stuff would go down and, trickle out well he ran through that and so i was like well his footprints are right here they're little tiny footprints they're about as wide as my iphone 11 pro plus or whatever this thing is called max pro or whatever but it's a little bit longer so i'd say maybe about eight or nine inches in length and i was like look at these little feet and you can see the little toes you can see the heel and i was like this is a crazy footprint and then i saw another one another one, another one and i was like i know i took photographs of these I took these pictures and I looked and he turned and he went across the road. So once he hit the road, I didn't know where his footprints were. I couldn't see any of his footprints. I looked along the other side of the road, couldn't see it. I looked down over the hill on the road, didn't see it. I looked out into the field across from me. I could see all the way down to homes way off in the distance and I could not see this kid. I'm like, where does a kid like that go? I went across into the grass and I looked around. There were sporadic trees here and there. And I was like, well, if this kid can run, he did good time somewhere because I have no idea where he went to. So I ended up walking back, told Jim all about it, ended up making myself breakfast. And we were talking about it until Mike and everybody else got up and they wanted to know what we were talking about. And I gave them the story and they're like, oh, that's interesting. So when I got done with my breakfast, I said, I'm going to go for another hike. I mean, go down to where you saw the ice shine. And Mike said, okay, and gave me a direction for it to go. And so I grabbed my camera and Dave Otke's grandson steps up and goes, hey, you know, can I go? I said, sure, I don't care. And he said, anybody else want to go? And everybody's like, no, we don't want to go. So they're going to sit back and they stayed at camp. Me and his grandson went walking down. God, it was like maybe a mile or two down to where we thought they were at. And we crossed over. We found this interesting little campsite. Like there were these two campsites on their own. To the right of those two campsites is this trail. And it goes back. And I was like, you know, these are two, two neat campsites. I think I'd like to camp out here sometime. So I take pictures of these campsites to, just to help me remember where these things were. We both get onto this trail. We start walking along this trail. And we see these, they almost look like a tree structure, but they don't quite fit what you would think a tree structure is. And we just kind of wander along. And the ground goes up higher than us. And it gets really woody. And it's nice there because there's a nice breeze that's blowing through. Unlike where we're camping. The breezes there are, are short-lived. They're just not lasting very long. But this area, you get these massive breezes, and it feels wonderful. So we walk out. We come across an ATV trail, and I was like, I wonder if this trail takes me back to that original road. And I said, that's interesting. Maybe I should walk that sometime. But I'm not going to do it now. So I look down into this valley, and it looks like you could go down into the valley. It looks like there's a hiking trail that leads down into it. But it doesn't look like it's ever been used. And I was like, that's weird. And so I walked back and we, I said, let's go down this finger and just kind of see what's down here. For people who don't know what a finger is, if you look at your hand and you see your fingers on your hand, a finger in environment is imagine that the fingers on your hand are what you're walking out on. So if you go over on the edge of your finger and you go down into like a wash, that's the size of your fingers. And then it connects back up to another finger. That's why they call it fingers if you ever wanted to know that stuff. So we were walking around on this one finger and we got to the very end and I was like, oh, this is neat. And so I went, woo, and I just yelled and it echoed and carried on down there. I was like, oh, that's neat. That's a great echo. We were, we're looking around and I started to notice that there are these pod-like structures. They kind of look like a hunter's blind. And what they use is bleached wood, like bleached out wood. And they're stacked in a weird way and they're stacked at an angle 
facing down into these ravines on the side of these fingers. And there was one like every 20 or 30 feet. There was like three or four that I counted when I was going up and down it. So I was like, I wonder what, if you can get into these. And so I found a way in and I sat down in one. And it was really ruined. I mean, you could fit like two or three people side by side in one. They were overly long. Like they didn't make sense on how long they were. And I was like, that's weird. But when I was sitting in it, I could see deer running around in the wash in front of me that I didn't even know were sitting there. And so I started whistling and carrying on and trying to get them to look at me. And I could see them looking up and looking around, but they didn't know where I was. And their ears were twitchy, trying to catch a smell or something on me. And they must have smelled me because eventually they kind of ran out of there and shot down the hill. And I said, this is crazy. I said, I'm going to go down into that wash. I'm going to see if I can see this blind. And he goes, okay. So he stood over by the blind. I went down into the wash and I went down like 15 feet, 20 feet. And I was looking around down there. I said, this is kind of nice down here. And I started looking around at all the trees and stuff above me. And I turned to the side where he should be at. And I realized I can't see those hunting blinds. I can't see them. They are perfectly hidden. And I was like, where are you at? And he told me, I'm right here. I'm like right above you. He said, can you see me? And he goes, oh yeah, I see you just fine. I couldn't see him. I could not see this guy. I was like, move your hands. And so he started moving his hands. I could barely pick him out through all the trees looking up through him. But he saw me like there was nothing blocking the way. And I was like, this is crazy. So I ended up going back up and we walked into the middle of this finger area because there's like this kind of goes around and there's like a little bit of a forest in the middle of this. And we go up into the middle of the forest and we notice that there are these two trees equal in height and they are broken branches at the exact same height hanging down. Like someone came up and said, I'm going to break this branch and then walked over to this other tree and he measured across it. I'm going to break that branch. And they're both branches are broken exactly at the same spot. I was like, that is weird. That's one of these weird oddities. So I backed up took a picture of it, went on. And then I found another tree that was kind of hanging out of ways. And it was broken almost like at five or six feet in height. And it was hanging down. It was a fresh break. And as he was walking up towards me, I said, I'm going to take a picture. He goes, all right. So I snapped his picture to show how tall he is compared to this. And I thought, well, I wonder if something broke this. He goes, well, couldn't have wind or snow do this? Well, yeah, I suppose if it's weak, and I looked at the tree and I was like, but the tree looks strong and there's no reason for it to break here. That's really kind of strange. So we ended up walking back and it took us like an hour or so to get back. You know, the heat was starting to get to us a little bit. I get back into the camp. We're talking about it. I'm showing Mike these pictures. And I said, you should go check these out. And he goes, yeah, let's go do that. So I said, let me get something to drink. So I downed some water and said, anybody else want to go? And Trent said he wants to go. Zach said he wanted to go and nobody else wanted to go. So it was me, Mike. Trenton and Zach. And so we start hiking down, down the road. We eventually get to that spot. I said, yeah, we were down over here to the left and Mike's looking down into this valley and goes, let's go down here. I said, all right. So we all ended up going down into this valley. As we're getting down there, it's getting lusher and lusher and lusher. There's pine trees to our right up above us. To our right, there's the ground that goes up pretty high and then it cuts down. Like there must be like a cliff side on that side. And it faces it. There's a little stream that goes by and we're coming down into this really lush area. And I'm like, wow, you would never guess that this is down here. And he goes, no, this is all old wood down here. And I was like, what do you mean by old wood? And he goes, it's an old forest. You know, loggers haven't gotten to this. And I was like, oh, this is weird. It's like time, the land that time forgot. And he goes, exactly. So we're wandering around and we're looking at you know, these crazy tree stumps that look like they were hit by lightning and they have a lot of different colors. And I was taking photographs of these things and I was looking for the artsy type of things to photograph while I was down in there. And Mike found this tree that had fallen over. And usually when you find the tree that's fallen over, the all the roots are usually in this big, flat, wide, fanned out area. And instead on this tree, all the roots were formed into like a big bowl, like a, a cereal bowl, just huge. And he said, Patrick, come on, look at this. And I walked over to this thing. I was like, trees don't do this. And he goes, you don't think so? I said, no. I used to work at Tagawa Nursery. I've never seen a tree do this unless you physically manipulated it yourself. There's no reason for this. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. So we're looking at this tree. We're looking at the roots and we're looking down inside it. And it looks like these things were woven into a big bowl. I was like, that is weird. And I said, Trenton, you should get in there. And he goes, no. (laughs) So just get in there so we can see how deep it is. And I think he did get into the bowl, but I don't actually remember anymore. If he was in it, he didn't stand it very long. 
we get out, we go wandering around, and I'm noticing that there's these holes all over around these pine trees, and the ground that we're stepping on is very squishy. And I started thinking about those spiders, and I'm looking at the ground here. I was like, you guys notice the holes on the ground? And they're like, yeah, that's kind of weird. And Mike thought maybe squirrels did it. I was like, man, a squirrel could crawl into that. That seems weird. Ground squirrel maybe? And he goes, well, yeah, maybe. But I mean, there were millions of these holes. And I was like, this is strange. So we're walking around it. We start walking around to the outside of these trees, stepping over the, the little stream. And we start coming back around. And we all walk by these series of trees. There's trees to our left, trees to our right. Trenton sees all these red berries on these shrubs, and it turned out to be raspberries. So he's sitting there contemplating if he should eat some of those raspberries. I go around and I decide I'm going to take a photograph of Mike and Trenton. And so I get the camera set up and I'm getting ready to go. As I'm focusing on Trenton or on Mike, Zach walks in front of me. And I said, Zach, I'm trying to take a picture and go, so? And I said, I can't take a photograph if you keep pacing back and forth in front of me. I said, why are you pacing? And he goes, I don't know. I'm just getting really kind of. I'm getting freaked out here. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, something's really bothering me. So he goes to my left. I said, just hang out here for a minute. He goes, okay. So Mike picks up a bone. He finds this little bone. It's only like made the thickness of a drumstick, like an actual drummer's drumstick. But it's only like about six to eight inches long from knuckle to knuckle. And he's looking at that going, oh, that's kind of weird. And there's bite marks all over it. So he's looking at it. He pulls out a little point and shoot camera. He's trying to take a picture of it. I said, yeah, you know, I'm going to take a picture of Mike and Trenton, you know, big footing the father and son together down here in the valley. So I got my camera up and I'm tapping it to wake up the camera to take the shot. Well, my camera, I had it selected to Mike and Trenton and my camera decides no. And it turns off on Mike and it selects Trenton and the trees behind Trenton. I was like, I don't want Trenton and the trees behind Trenton. I want, I want Mike. And so I'm going back and forth trying to get the camera to quit selecting Trenton and the trees versus Mike and Trenton. And I just said, oh, the heck with it. I'll just take the shot. Well, what I didn't realize is my camera was trying to tell me, knucklehead, there is something in these trees. (laughs) And I photographed, you know, I did this picture and this picture shows Mike. Mike's in focus. Trenton's in focus. And everything in a line, in like almost a straight line, is in focus. And there's something standing in these trees. Now, we all walked by these trees, and we did not notice this individual at the base of of the trees. We had no idea this individual was there. We all walked by him. Our eyes were on the ground looking where we were going. We didn't notice. We didn't hear. We didn't smell. There was nothing telling us there is another individual within 15 feet of Trenton, 20 feet of Mike, because Trenton is five feet behind Mike. And five feet from me. So he's uh, 30 feet altogether, 25, 30 feet from me. I did not know he was there. No idea. And so I take the shot and I said, okay. And Trent goes, well, can we eat these berries? And I said, well, yeah, the raspberries. And then Mike said, well, wait, are there any berries on the ground? And I was like, why is that important? And he said, because if this is a food source, let's say for a Sasquatch, what else out here eats these raspberries? And I said, birds, squirrels, rabbits, bear. And then we heard moose and then we heard goats. We named off almost everything out there. And he goes, right. And they would shred these plants to get to the berries. And I said, that's true. They would destroy this. He goes, but these plants look pristine. And I said, that's also true. And so Trent, he just bends over and goes, pluck, 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 pluck. And he plucks a whole bunch of these, like a little small handful. And he goes, well, I'm going to try some. And he drops two in his mouth right away and goes, wow, these are really good. His dad took one and. Zach took a couple and he, he walks over to me and he goes, you want to take it? And I said, not really. He goes, well, I'm going to throw it on the ground. And I said, well, then you're wasting food. He goes, well, then just take it. And I was like, oh, peer pressure from a kid. So like, all right, fine. So I took it and I was holding my hand, really debating on not eating this thing and just putting it out like on a tree somewhere. But I ended up devouring it and it tasted really good. And I was like, wow, that is actually better than anything found in the stores. So we walk all the way back. We get back to the campsite and people are tearing down and getting ready to go home. And I was like, all right. I said, I'm already pre-packed, so I'm just going to take off and go down the road. And he said, okay, I'm just going to see where this road takes us. So Mike was still turned down with Zach and Trent, and they were all tearing, helping tear down the stuff. And I take off and go up through the mountains and found my way out. Jim finds his way out going a different direction. And I came across Robin Roberts, and Jim Roberts was out wandering around. And I found Robin and 
her dog Rue, got them into the car, drove them back to the campsite, let them off, and I turned around and I left and ended up going home. So everybody's gone home. I'm sitting at the town home and I'm going through all the pictures. And I get to this picture and I'm looking at Trenton, Mike, and the trees. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm looking at Mike and it's like, I wonder why the camera was looking at Trenton and the trees. And it took me a split second and I see this darkened face. And to me, it's looking across at some other trees. And I was like, oh, that can't be right. I start to zoom in just a little bit, just to kind of look at it. Because I know if I zoom in too far, it's going to pixelate and all kinds of world of hurt is going to come from that. So I was like, I didn't want to zoom in on this too much. So I only go in about 20 or 30%. I can go as deep as 400% using the software that I have. And I kept looking at this thing going, that is a face. And I can see the nostrils, the, the frown, like whatever this is, is not happy that we're there. And I was like, okay, so I can see the head. And then it dawned on me, okay, if that's the head, there should be arms. I should see hands. And I saw, I spotted two hands. And then I looked down to the ground and I found its foot. So I got at least the right foot. I got two hands. And I got a face. I said, that's cool. Right away, I text Mike. I said, hey, Mike. And he goes, yeah. And then he was sitting at his computer doing stuff. And I said, hey, I think I photographed Sasquatch. And he goes, where? And I said, on our trip. He said, you mean down to Lanthrop? And I said, yeah. And he goes, no, you didn't. There's no way you found something like that. And I was like, I'm telling you, I photographed something that doesn't make sense. And he's like, Patrick, you know, I know you're a part of Sir now, and this is all great, but you don't need to impress me with a photograph of a Sasquatch. I said, Mike, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to tell you that I photographed something with you and Trenton in the photograph. And he was like, where was this at? I said, down in that valley. And he said, send me that picture. I said, okay. I can't just text it to him. So I ended up emailing it to him. And I was waiting. I was like, where is he at? Why isn't he responding? I was expecting, okay, you're out of sir, whatever. And he didn't do it. But what he was doing was making a sandwich and <laughs> getting something to drink. And so here I am stressing out. He finally comes back, opens up the picture. It takes him all but 10 seconds to see that face. And he goes, holy crap. And he circles it. And then he notices on the far end of this picture, there's a vertical tree and there's a tree that's on the ground. And in between the tree that's on the ground and the vertical one, there is a silhouette, a half silhouette of a person standing there, or at least something hairy, standing upright, being backlit by the sun from when I took that photograph. Again, on the opposite side of that tree, there's another one sitting there, almost the same height. And he circled that too. And he goes, oh my God. So he, he writes me back. He said, I'm sending you something. I said, okay. And here sat this picture with all these circles. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, you are lucky to get a shot like that. And I said, well, you know, it's happened a couple of times before at Wellington. He goes, right. But you know what? I don't know what we should do. I said, let's go back. Let's go back next week. He goes, all right. All right, we'll do that. We'll go back down there next week. I said, okay. I'm all excited. I'm packing up my gear. I'm making sure all my batteries are charged up. Everything is in there, the cots in my car and everything. And he said, this time you're going to sleep in my tent. And I said, that's fine. So I go over, I meet Mike. Do you believe I was, no, I drove myself down there. We went down like just him and I. And so it was him, Trenton, and myself. There's just the three of us. Nobody else was invited. We drove all the way down to that site. I said, let's camp at that one camping site that leads down to it. And he goes, good idea. So we drove down to that spot. Hopefully there was nobody in there and there wasn't. So we set up his tent. We put the cots in Mike's tent. So if you look at Mike's tent, he has one of those, one of those big white canvases tent, a big zipper in the front. And when we got it all set up, Mike looked at me and he goes, my zipper on my tent is broken. I said, are you serious? He goes, yeah, we can't camp in this. If something comes in, we can't stop it from coming in. I'm like, oh, that's not good. And I said, you know what? I got a tarp. So I grabbed the tarp out and we strung it up. So it's going across the front door and it's blocking the front door. So if something comes in, we're going to hear it coming into the tent. In order to get in, you have to walk in through the side. The canvas is on one side and the plastic tarp is on the other and you're walking right down the middle and then you hang it right and go in. So if you look at Mike's tent, you have a window to the back. Again, it's 15 feet long and 10 feet wide and nine feet in height. So it's the perfect house. So Mike and Trenton are on, technically, if you're standing in the front entrance, they're on the left side, I'm on the right. So I'm the only person on the right side. There's a table dividing myself and Mike. There's a table at the far end of my feet down at the bottom. And it goes Mike, Trenton, and then uh, there's a chair in front of Mike to put his stuff on it. 
And there's a chair just beyond Trenton, so he can put stuff on that chair as well. When I showed up, I brought chocolate chip cookies, oatmeal cookies. I bought a pretty big bag. It was like a two-pound bag of almonds and cranberries that were, I guess, soaked in orange juice. And I thought, this was a great meal for them. You know, I'm going to share this with these guys. Mike brought up strawberries and he's like, yep, I got out. We got out of food, you know, we can share, but we're just going to take these things down first. I said, okay, once we get everything done, he said, let's go for a hike. And I said, okay. So we left everything inside the, the cars and stuff. I didn't pull any of the food out. All of our food basically was either in containers underneath Mike's truck or in my car. And then everything was locked down. So we go out for a hike. I have my big camera on. I now have what's called a, we call it a Cyclops, but it's this little blue camera that mounts to my head, kind of like a GoPro, but it's long and it looks like almost like a blue pipe. It's called an Air something or other, but it's, it's a little video camera that I found on Amazon. And I put a chip in it. And I made sure this thing was fully powered and I brought my night vision gear, but I don't use that in the daylight. I got that thing running on my head and I got my camera set aside. And we start walking around, start going down the hill. And I thought, you know what? I'm not taking this camera with me on my head. I'm just not going to do it. So I took the thing off, left it inside the tent, ran back, dropped it off, went down with my camera and started going down into the, into the valley. We're looking at the area. We start taking pictures of us standing back where this so-called kid was. When I recreated that shot, there was no kid there. There was nothing to say that was what it is. You know, that is Peridoria. Because as you'd be able to sit back, line up everything exactly where it was at, and there was this one stick that kind of cuts through the picture. And I was looking at it going, okay, Trenton, stand back a little bit. Okay, stand here, stand there. And I said, that's right where he was because I can see the stick. I was looking at the original on my iPad, looking at what he was doing. I was like, okay, that's right. This is what it's supposed to be. So I took that photograph. Then I had Mike stand there. And I said, Mike, that kid, it's got to be a child. And he's like, no, it has to be an adult. And I said, it can't be. That's like, I've seen adults sitting down in a squat. They are easily six feet tall. There's no reason for them to be anything lower than that. And he's like, okay. So I said, I think it's a kid because it's coming up to whatever that height of that branch is. And we determined it was about three feet in height. And I said, that makes more sense because I, I didn't see any knees protruding out. And if he's squatting, he, we would see the knees sticking out somewhere. And he's like, that's true. We ruled that out. We ended up walking down we were going to go up this other path that takes us up over this this mountain and i was like are we going to go up that and he goes no he goes we're going to go down this trail that kind of skirts along this creek and i was like okay i said why and he goes because it looks squatchy and i said okay so now mike's been doing this for 30 years so i'm walking and he goes mike trenton and me and so we're getting to this area and you can hear the little babbling brook going on and Mike stops and he goes down into these trees that's between us and the creek. I start hearing popping sounds above our heads. And then, of course, it's the trees going back and forth. And so I take my camera, turn on video, and I start filming that. And I'm listening to it. And Trenton's like, wow, that is really kind of creepy up there. And I said, yeah, it is. I start to pan down slowly. And I turn the camera back the way it should be facing. And I come down. And just as I'm getting the mic, I hear him talking about how there's something weird about these rocks on the ground. And like, what's so special about the rocks? And he goes, I don't know. There's something on the ground, how they're, how they're placed. It seems weird. I said, okay, well, Mike walks up past us. Now I'm still filming past Mike. He's walking past. I don't notice anything in the background. I don't notice anything at all. As Mike steps past us, all three of us hear this. Ooh. And the sound goes on for a little bit, and then we don't hear it no more. And I was like looking at Trent, and he goes, did you hear that? And he goes, dude, did you hear that? And I was like, yeah, I heard that. I'm right next to you. And Mike comes running up behind us. Guys, did you just hear that? And I said, yeah. Mike said, what did it sound like? And Trent's first words out of his mouth was something like, Orsh. I was like, what were you listening to? Did you even hear the octaves? And he's like, yeah. And I said, it didn't sound like that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's weird. And I was still filming the rock face that's across from us. What I didn't realize is on this video, I sat back and I watched this video a million times and I'd never really caught on to this until a couple of years ago. And I was watching the video again before a Nebraska Bigfoot conference. And I noticed movement when Mike turned and he was looking at me to his right, 
in between some series of trees, you can see movement and it's going crazy. So as Mike turns, I had to take myself on and I was filming this. You can see something rise up slowly. You can see the rough body, the head, the shoulders. This thing turns on a dime. And as Mike is slowly walking past us, it's tiptoeing and it's pitching its shoulders to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left. And eventually it turns to its right and goes uphill. And I lose it from that point. And I caught all that on video. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. And then I started thinking, I wonder if I got more video of this. And so I went back and I rewatched the video. So right when the camera comes down and I'm looking at Mike, I stop the video and I start to rewind it backwards slowly. And I see whatever stood up behind Mike gets down to a crouch position, turns it, and this is in reverse, turns around and gets into like a crawling position and crawls backwards over a log into it, like this little open area to the right. So now I knew where to look. It looks like it, it turns its body around, like it's looking towards Mike when Mike was talking. And then it gets to like a rested position. And I was like, oh my God. So I started to go forward again. And I started watching this carefully. And I saw all that play out in real time watching the video. And I was like, how did I miss all this? This is cool. But at that moment in time, I didn't see any of that. We just heard that vocal. I was like, okay, this is crazy cool. So when we heard that, I was filming the face. And I started to think I was seeing individualized heads poking out of different areas of that hill. But I was like, I didn't know if I was just seeing things or not. So Mike ends up leaving, Trenton leaves, and then I turn around and I walk off and I'm still filming live. So I'm walking around with the camera and zooming in and out. And Mike gets to this tree and the tree has all these broken branches and stuff off of it. And we found hair all over this thing, all over the sap. And we were looking at it and we were talking about it. We didn't have any collections, anything to collect anything with. Mike is now pretty much in for the experience of finding Sasquatch, not so much the discovery of it because he already knows they exist. So we're looking at stuff and I'm filming it. And he's like, why don't I hear you taking pictures? And I said, because I have this on video. And he goes, you're videotaping all this? I went, yeah. And he goes, did you videotape the vocal? And I went, yeah. I don't have my shotgun mic, so I don't know how much the microphone actually heard. And he's like, oh, we should see if you can actually hear it. And I said, yeah, I'm hoping to when I get back. So we get to a down log, this really big log, and it's got branches all over it. And this thing is really big. I mean, you can't, it would take two people to body hug this tree to actually touch hand to hand and how big this was. So Trenton decides that he's going to climb on top of it and jump over. Mike and I, because we're not that limber or agile, we had to go under it. Mike gets under it just fine. I get under it and I impel my back against some of the sticks hanging down. So I was like, that was not cool. We ended up walking all the way back along, following the creek, walk through all these beautiful aspens. It's not a sound of nothing going on outside of birds. And we're, we're walking all the way back. We don't feel anything weird. We just thought it was strange that we heard vocals back there. And you know, we're talking about it as we're walking down. And we find a place where you can cross the stream and you can see where there's a trailhead defined They're going across the stream, going around, you know, where we can't see it no more. I started looking around and I noticed that there's a structure to my right and it's on the ground. It's flat. I said, Mike, this is a structure. And he goes, oh no, that's a bunch of sticks. I said, no, this is a structure. And he goes, how do you know? I said, it's a three-pointed star. I said, one point leads across the stream. One point leads from where we came. And the other point leads down where this trailhead goes. And he goes, oh yeah, look at that. That's pretty cool. He goes, but why would somebody do that? It's not for us. He goes, what do you mean? I said, this is for like Sasquatch. So imagine if you're super tall and you're trying to figure out where to go. And if they're following trailheads, this is a, a marker for them to either go to the right, to the left, or straight ahead, or back the way they came. And he goes, oh, that's pretty cool. I said, not everything on the ground is junk. And he goes, well, and sir, we don't look at that. We don't look at these things. And I said, you might need to start. I tried to get a photograph of that, and my camera died at that moment. So I was like, all right, well, the battery just died. So I turned it off slid it up to my shoulder. And then we ended up walking back, got all the way back to the campsite. I swapped out batteries when I was there. And I was like, I'd really like to get back down to that spot. And he's like, well, yeah, probably not, not today, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to, before we eat, let's go grab our, our stuff. We're going to share it with them down here. I said, okay. So we go up and I grab my bags of stuff, my cookies and stuff. And Mike grabs his bag of strawberries. Trent doesn't grab anything, but you know, he grabs a bowl. And so we all go hiking back down into that valley. I find this log 
it's a, a small tree. It's got a dugout spot in the center that's, I don't know, maybe a few feet in length. And I thought, this is a great spot where I'm going to put my nuts and my cookies. So I put out the almonds and the cranberries and mix them together in this little trench area of this log. You can tell that something's been straddling this because the grass on both sides of this log have been worn down to where it looks like someone's foot or their feet have been sitting there. And I pointed that out and he goes, yeah, put food there. We'll make sure that we clean this up. And so we smoothed out the earth. So you couldn't see anything just in case they're going to sit here. And I put two chocolate chip cookies on one side and two oatmeal cookies on the other. And I was like, that looks good enough. And Mike said, that looks great. And I said, okay. So I still have a big bag of the nuts and a big bag of the cranberries plus two bags of cookies. So Mike goes over to the bowl, the weird looking bowl thing that's made out of the tree roots. He puts down his bowl and he puts in two large cups of strawberries into the thing. It leaves it there. He goes, oh, we'll see. You know, if a bear hits it, they're going to shred this bowl to nothing. I said, that's true. We start walking back out. We go up that trail leading out. There's nothing in the trail while we were down, going up and down this thing. We start hiking up. Mike turns around. I turn around and I see Trent and he's already making the turn to head back to camp. Mike turns around and yells, ooh, food, yummy, yummy, food, food. And the entire right side of that hill where the vocal came from, becomes alive and it sounds like there's a herd of people (laughs) running down the side of this hill to get to the bottom and they stop right at the base. We saw some debris kind of going out and I was like, oh my gosh. Mike's like, that was a lot of people. That was a lot of something. And he goes, right. So he goes, okay, let's go. And it's like, are you sure you don't want to see and watch? He goes, they won't come out until we leave. I said, okay. So Mike turns, he starts walking back. I go up about 50 feet And I kind of turn to this little landing area and I can hear whatever's happening there starts migrating quickly into that area where like they're, they're going to graze on stuff. It's really strange. So we go up that night and we're sitting there, we're talking and stuff. I break out my night vision camera and I start to film across towards the other campsite, which is about two or three feet below elevation from where we're sitting at. I notice I see this little flickery light thing going on. I'm like, I'm looking at it. I can see it, but I'm looking at it through the camera and I'm like, well, that's weird. And I look out at it. When I look out at it, it looks solid. When I look at it through the camera, it has a flickery light effect to it. And that might be from the arrow light hitting this thing. We were all talking about it. And I was like, is that a car? And Mike's like, you know, I don't know. It could be a car. It's kind of strange. And I said, yeah, it is kind of strange. After about five or six minutes and looking at that, and you could actually see cars driving around down in the valley. And I was like, oh. That's weird. I can see cars all the way down there. That's neat. You see when cars turn and that sort of thing. But then this flickery light thing turns and it looks straight on at the camera. I'm seeing two flickery lights now. And I was like, dude, those are eyeballs. And he goes, what? And he looks over and Mike can kind of see the eyes just kind of sitting there. And then we see the blink happening. I see the blinks of the camera. Mike sees the blinking just happening. Trenton's looking at it like, whoa, look at that. Whatever this is, is taller than us. So standing up, again, I'm five foot 10 and three quarter inches tall. This guy is at least eight, nine feet in height because of the height difference between where we're standing, where, what his elevation is. And we see him turn to his right and he walks like, he, like he's walking off the stage. And I was like, that was weird. And so I turn off the camera for a second, turn it back on. And he comes walking back out where I can see his left side, turns, looks right back at me. It looks to his right, looks to his left. And it's like, there's almost humor. And he turns and he walks the opposite direction. And after that, I didn't see him anymore. And I was like, I was cracking up, just laughing at watching this. I was like, this is like watching comedy. I, I never thought these things would be, they would have a form of comedy involved in this. So I ended up turning off the camera and then I, but I turned it back on and I started filming Mike. And I was filming Trenton. And I said, do you want to see what, what we look like, Trenton? He goes, sure. So I hand him the, the camera. So he starts looking at me and goes, oh, my gosh, you're freaky looking. And then he looked at his dad and he said, oh, he said, you're freaky looking too. And I eventually took the camera and then I turned it off and packed it away. And we got done with our meals and stuff. And he said, Let, you know, I think it's time for us to go to bed. And I said, yeah, all right. So we all go into the tent and we kind of secure things. I made sure the door was locked. And my car is covered in dust because I always wash it before I go somewhere just to get all kinds of dirt dust to get on it. Because if anything touches my car, it will leave a print. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave it like that. This will be perfect. I get inside the tent. 
I get into my sleeping bag and I'm laying there and it literally took me about maybe 20 seconds. And I know I was talking to Mike at one point and I was snoring the next. So I'm out, Trenton's out, Mike's awake. Mike's tent, I have to stress this over and over again. His tent is an outfitter's tent. There is no floor in his tent. There is no floor. You put your feet down, you're on earth. You're standing on grass, cactus, snakes, spiders, whatever is there, you're going to stand on it. You got to be fully aware that there's nothing on that where we're standing is ground, fresh, clean, dirty ground. It's all right there in front of you. So I am laying there snoring away and Mike starts to hear something coming up the trail, coming towards our campsite. And he can tell that there's two things. He just doesn't know what it is. And it comes up and he starts to hear us running. And he's like, Patrick, 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 what? Dude, was I snoring? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Everybody snores. Listen. And what I'm hearing sounds like a kid running. And this kid is running fast. Now, Mike's tent, if you stand up next to it, at the five foot mark, there is a hole and there's a pin that goes through it from where the pipe is sticking up. He ties a quarter inch rope to that down to a spike down onto the ground. And there is enough space for a three foot tall individual to run down the center of that without touching the rope, but it would be touching the, the canvas. So we start hearing the running going on. He runs right past me. I was like, oh my gosh. And he shot past me and I could hear his finger on the tent. And it sounded like, like that going down the tent. And I was like, oh my God. He turns, runs past the front door area, which is that tarp. That tarp lifts off the ground. And both Mike and I sat up and went, oh, no, 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 no. And the, the tarp came back down. We're like, whoo. And I said, Mike, can they come in? He goes, oh, yeah, he could come in now. He goes, I didn't think about tying that down. <laughs> so we're like, oh, man. Well, he runs the length within a second or two, turns, runs past the front within a second runs past Mike within a couple of seconds. And he's like, he's right here. And by the time Mike says that, the kid turns and he runs past me again, where my head is, turns, runs past me. He makes time, really quick time. And I'm like, what is going on? And Mike's like, I've never experienced this before. This is weird. And I was like, what's causing this? What is physically causing this? I said, this isn't normal. And Mike said, no, this is not normal. Usually they're, they're hanging out. They mill through things. They're playing with stuff. He goes, I've never experienced this. <laughs> so the kid runs over and stops to my left. And, and I'm stopped. I said, Mike. And I'm looking at Mike. I can see Mike because my eyes have adjusted to the darkness. I said, Mike. He goes, what? And I said, he's to my left. Now, on a cot, you have six legs. You have two legs at the feet, two legs at the midsection, two legs at your shoulders, right? Well, I get lifted off the ground. This thing reaches in, grabs the cot, and lifts me two feet into the air, proceeds to shake me like a, a ketchup bottle, waiting for that anticipation to come out. And oh my gosh, I was going up and down. I grabbed hold of the cot and I was freaking. I was like, is it normal for them to shake you? And, and Mike's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is normal, Patrick. Don't worry about it. And I was like, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, don't worry about it. This is normal. This is what they normally do. They reach in, they grab the cot and they shake it. Now, Mike is thinking that I'm being shaken right to left, not up and down. He doesn't have any idea I'm in the air. So <laughs> he's shaking me up and down. And so I was like, all right. So I smacked the side of the tent and I said, knock it off. And he let me go. And the cot hits. And I'm like, what? The? Well, that kind of hurt. And Mike said, what was that noise? And I said, he let me go. He goes, what do you mean? I said, dude, I was in the air. He goes, what do you mean you were in the air? I said, I was in the air. I was being shaken up and down in the air. And he's like, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And so the kid takes off runs down to the front entrance, runs past the front entrance. Again, the tarp moves, comes back up to where Mike is. And he goes, he's over here by me. And I said, yeah, I can hear him. He reaches in and I'm looking at Mike and Mike gets lifted off the ground, the same height. And you could see terror. The basic facial features of Mike became known really quick because Mike went in the air and the thing was shaking Mike up and down again, like a ketchup bottle. And I was like, Mike, how does that feel? <laughs> He's like, Patrick, this is disconcerting. And he has got a death grip on his cot thinking he's going to fall. However, this kid has it. I don't know how he held me or why I didn't flip over to my right. But he had the same thing with Mike. Mike was in the air being shaken up and down. 
And he goes, what did you do to get him to stop? I said, knock it off. And I hit the tent, but I don't recommend doing that. And he goes, why? He's going to drop you. And he's like, oh, well, eventually he puts Mike down and he puts him down gently. unlike me. And we both hear. <laughs> and I was like, what was that? And he goes, Patrick, that's a giggle. And we hear <laughs> again. And I was like, Mike, what is, are you telling me he's giggling? He's giggling. I said, where is he now? And he's like, hold on. He's by Trenton. Now Trenton's head is at Mike's feet. So Mike sits there for a few seconds and he goes, oh my God, Trenton. So he reaches down, grabs Trenton by the shoulders. Wake up, boy, wake up, wake up, boy, wake up, wake up. You need to wake up, Trenton, wake up. And Trenton's like waking up and he pulls out his earbuds. He goes, what is it with you old guys? And I was like, what do you mean old guys? He goes, why can't you just let me in? Before he could say the word sleep, all three of us here, <laughs> and Trenton's head turns like a horror film, like he looks at the canvas. He jumps out of his sleeping bag, drags his cot and everything over in between my cot and Mike's cot. And I said, what about your gear? And he runs over, grabs that, brings it over, and he goes, now, you two guys go to sleep. And I was like, Trenton, Mike and I were both lifted in the air and shaken like a rag doll. And he's like, you're not serious. And Mike said, yeah, that's what we wanted you to experience it. He goes, I don't want to experience that. They'll give me nightmares. I don't want to experience that at all. And I was like, come on, you're a big time Bigfooter. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to do that. So he ends up getting back into the sleeping bag, puts it in his earbuds, and he's out. Mike and I are talking for a little bit. And then I notice Mike drifts off and he goes to sleep. I cannot sleep now. I am fully awake because of this. And I can hear the kid running around still, and he's still kind of running about. And then he goes over to my side of the tent, and he's kind of playing around in the rocks and stuff. I could hear this other one standing just probably about five or six feet from us. And it sounds like if you look at your palm of your hand, with the opposite hand, you take your thumb and you press it up against your first finger, and you create that point. Like if you hold it up, you can see a point. And you put that against the palm of your other hand, and you're just kind of working it. That's what it sounded like I was listening to happening right out here. Like this rock is being stood on and they're rocking back and forth, kind of like a pressure point deal. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I'm just listening to that. Eventually that quits and I can hear that individual start to walk off. And I hear this vocal, this really strange vocal. Now, Charlie Raymond talked about a vocal that he had two people on an outing like a month ago, if that, that they heard a weird vocal. and. I've heard this vocal three times, three different areas in Colorado, and this was the first time I heard this. But there's also a vocal that the BFRO caught on audio, and it's the identical vocal. It's the same thing. So the sound sounds like this. And I was like, what the heck was that? And whatever that call is, that little kid went, duk, 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 ran over to mom, picked them up, and off they went. They disappeared into the the brush. Didn't really hear anything after that. I'm just kind of sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm like, is something else going to happen? And like an hour passes, I'm still kind of waiting. I can hear the wind. It sounds like there's a lot of something coming into play. Like there's a group coming in. Our cars are about 20 feet from our tent and it goes down to a slope and it banks back up to the, all these shrubs. And these shrubs are pretty tall. There's trees and shrubs intermixed. And it sounds like a group is coming in. As they're coming in, I'm laying there going, what's going on? And I'm looking at Mike, he's asleep. I see Trent, he's asleep. I look at the top of my section of that pitched roof, and that starts to glow. Not like an incredibly crazy glow. It's like someone's taking two flashlights, they turn them on, and they hang them over the top of that tent. So, And they're going like, they're pulling back and pulling and going in, like they're trying to look into the top of that tent. So whatever this is, Whatever is there, they're coming up to the side of my tent and they're leaning over and they're creating this glowing effect. Now, I look at Mike's side of the tent, I don't see that happening. But on my side of the tent, it looks like these weird light patterns paired. They're kind of twisting to the right, to the left. They're looking down and they're pulling back and looking down and pulling back because you can see the change up of the light source is getting tight and then it starts to fade off and then it gets tight and fades off. And it almost sort of looked like a water effect going on across the surface. And I was like, that is really kind of neat. And I watched that for about 45 minutes. And then slowly they meandered back out towards the shrubs and disappeared. And eventually they all left and I ended up falling asleep. So I woke up that morning and 
I get dressed and I go out wandering around, looking around and I'd walked over to my car. The driver's side door of my car had a handprint on it. And I sat there and I looked down at it. I was like, oh my God, look at that thing. And I put my hand to it and I took a photograph of my hand up next to this. And this thing made my hand look small. And I was like, that's a pretty big handprint. And then I found other prints on my car where it looked like they were touching the glass, trying to touch whatever this this stuff was that I had inside the, the window. And I was like, that's neat. So I walked over and I said, Mike, you should come out and look at my car. And so he looked at the car and he goes, well, look at the size of the handprint. I was like, I know. That's cool. And he goes, did you take pictures? I'm like, yeah, I took a good handful. And he's like, okay, cool. We ended up going back and we were talking and he said, that was crazy last night. And I said, there was something else that happened. And I kind of described it. And he goes, really? You didn't want to wake me up? And I was like, no, you were out cold. I didn't know if you would be angry or not. So I, I just didn't wake you up. And he's like, all right, well, that's fine. So we walked around the tent looking for tracks. And we did find little footprints that were running around the inside perimeter of that tent. And I said, dude, that's a little footprint. And he's like, look at the size, how small it is. And we were all looking at it going, that's pretty neat. We took pictures. I think we took like little measurements of stuff here and there, but we didn't cast anything. The footprint wasn't deep enough. The ground was too hard. We just didn't, we didn't even think about doing it. So he said, no, photographs are just fine. Don't worry about doing a cast. We ended up saying, you know, we're going to pack up and go. I said, we should go down and do we need to go down to the, the town at all? He goes, well, no. And I said, well, let's go down into the valley and see what's down in there. And he said, oh, let's see if the food's gone. He goes, all right. So we're walking down. And as we're walking down the trailhead, I look up. Mike walks right past us. I said, Mike, did you see the tree break? And he goes, no. And he walked back. And it was just above his head. Something just made a clean break. Like it just broke the branch right there. I was like, look at that. That's new. That wasn't there before. And he goes, no, that wasn't there before. So we go down into the valley. I look over at the log. And there are two footprint impressions inside there where you could kind of make out toes on both sides of that log. All my stuff was gone. And I started to think about it. And I said, you know why Junior was all bent out of shape? And he goes, no. And I said, he probably got the cookies. And he started thinking about that. He goes, oh, man. I said, if they already have superhuman strength and good little Junior got his hands on chocolate chip cookies or oatmeal cookies, there's loads of sugar in that stuff. And he was like, yes. And I said, like, I'm not going to leave cookies out this time. I'll just leave out the basic nuts and berries. And he's like, okay, I put another batch out there at that moment in time. We walked over and he goes, I can't find the bowl. I said, what do you mean? He goes, the bowl's gone. The bowl of strawberries is missing. So we walk over and he looks down inside and he goes, no, it's down inside the bowl. He tried to reach for it. I tried to reach for it. And we said, Trenton, can you get that? And he goes, yeah. He reaches down, pulls it out. And you can see that there were fingerprints on that side of that bowl. And he goes, you know, a bear wouldn't have done that. And I said, no, a bear would have shredded that bowl. He goes, exactly. And he said, so this is maybe for Junior. So Junior gets placed inside this bowl, like a little playpen. They shared the strawberries amongst them. And then they gave the rest to Junior. And I said, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And so we were really discussing about how cool this was. We ended up, we went down the trailhead again, kind of looked around. And we ended up going back up. And so we spent most of the day on near around the campsite. We went down and around. We did find a nest, a Sasquatch nest in a stream bed that's like, if you went down the hill from where we were camping, back around, there was like little waterfalls and such. But back in there, it was really lush. And we found what appeared to be a Bigfoot nest. All nests are, are just pine boughs that have been broken off trees, stripped from the trees and lay down on the ground. And we found pieces of string inside this nest. Now the string, Mike is pretty sure that Sasquatch's juvenile or young babies will play with the string like a toy, like a kid plays with a squishy animal, you know, like a, a little plush toy. And they probably play with the string, you know, just kind of chew on it or whatever. But that's what he was thinking. And as I was looking around that area, I found little tiny footprints, little like handprints in the mud, footprints in the mud. I was like, oh, this is cool. We were taking all kinds of pictures. We were wandering back inside there, got back out to the cars, turned around, and we ended up driving back up. We drove down to that spot. We drove back up to different areas, and we just wanted to see the lay of the land, see what else was around in the area. There was a lot of interesting stuff back up in there. And so we came back to our campsite, and he said, well, I'm going to make brats and spaghetti. I said, okay, I'm all right with that. This was our last night there, and so we ended up making these brats. And then, well, Mike chose a spicy broth. 
we had no idea of this at first. And so here I'm eating it. I have acid reflux issues like crazy. Here I'm eating the spaghetti and meat sauce that, of course, has got tomatoes in it. And again, that, that will fire this. So I'm very careful about what I'm eating. Well, now I'm realizing I'm eating super hot you know, brats. And I'm like, oh, well, I can't eat too many of these. And he goes, why? And I said, because it was spicy. He goes, did I buy spicy? I said, yeah, I can't. I have to be careful of these. We ended up taking a big plate of this spaghetti, meat sauce, and these, we cut them up into pieces, but these big chunks of brats, right? So he kind of tucks them into spaghetti. We take it down and put it on that log that has the crazy bowl. And we come back up to the tent. Now that night, if something happened, we were not aware of it. I slept through it. Mike slept through it. There were no crazy kids. I didn't hear anything. There was nothing happening. I eventually drifted off and fell asleep. By morning, we got up and I said, hey, let's go back down there and look at that. And he goes, okay. So we go down there and we're looking at the plate and the plate's sitting there. You can still see the spaghetti sitting there and you can see the meat sauce in there. And some of the pieces of um, sausage were missing, but not all of them. So we were looking at that and I said, do you suppose it's too spicy for him? And he goes, that could be the case. And that could be the reason why we didn't have any experiences last night, because we may have accidentally given them upset stomachs. And so they were busy. I said, oh, that could very well be. So we looked at it and the spaghetti had been stretched off the plate or off the bowl up onto the log and up about like three or four feet. And I was like, that's weird. And I said, why are you supposed to do that? And he goes, I don't know. Maybe they were eating the meat and they just got sick of it. And I said, no, oh, yeah, maybe. And we were looking around on the ground. We couldn't find any of the meat pieces on the ground. Or maybe if they threw them, we didn't see them. But there were still like three or four pieces still sitting inside the, the plate. The rest of them were covered with the spaghetti. Like they didn't want it no more. We were done. So Mike ended up taking all that out. We took it back up. We threw it out. Again, I left a lot more nuts and stuff for them because I figured this was still safe for them. They're not showing signs or anything. They're still eating what I'm putting out. So we ended up packing up everything and then we left. Now, we had other events that we had to do during the year, during that year. And there's other crazy stories that are in around that year and the next year and the next year. But Mike and I tried to get back out there one other time. Well, we made it down there a year later. So this time we brought out my TP and I set this thing up. We were there for Mike's speech thing again. He did his speech. It was just him and I. And every year there seemed to be less and less people. They eventually just said, you know, you guys don't need to come back down here no more. People are just not interested in hearing about Bigfoot. But like, that's fine. We're sitting up at the campsite and my teepee's got a floor. You can't access it that way. You can access all of the vents because all the vents, all the zippers are on the outside. All the window access is on the inside. So I can roll up or close the windows. Nothing can peek in without my approval except for the vents. So we go out, we show up, the tent's all made. We go down into the valley. I leave off the nuts and stuff. And I got my camera with me. And now I got my, my Cyclops camera powered up, fully ready to go. Extra chips, extra batteries. I'm good. I'm not going to worry about this thing. So we're walking down into the valley. We're looking around. And Mike said, let's go down here. And so we're walking by. I said, well, this is where the vocal was. He goes, yeah. And we're looking around and I'm paying close attention. To any movement, slight movement, anything. Don't hear anything. As we're getting deeper into it, we're noticing that there is destruction going on. Like trees have been broken and snapped. They're leaning over, blocking things. And we figured out that the BLM, um, who owns the land there, they were running cattle into the area. The more the cattle got in there, the more destruction they got. Well, something in that valley does not like cattle. And so they started breaking trees and they broke trees all over the place. My first thought was it was a downdraft from the storm or something that caused these trees to snap. But these trees are crisscrossing themselves. They're woven into each other. And I was like, I'm retracting that thought real quick. And Mike's like, what? And I said, well, I was thinking it was maybe a downdraft that created this. And Mike said, no, this is something mad. And I said, yeah, exactly. They're, they're angry about something. We get under the log. We come across where this beautiful open area used to be of straight vertical aspens all snapped. Everything's broken. We are stepping over these things. We're walking around them. Cattle could not get through to this spot unless it was a foolish cow. There was no reason for a cow to make it through this. It was just a nightmare. We go walking back and walking back. We're going further and further back into it. 
I'm seeing things. He's seeing things. We're pointing out things. Well, we stop on this trail and Mike points out that there's this new trail to the left. We're going to go down that trail. I said, so we're not going to go down the original. He goes, no, let's go down this one. I said, okay. So Mike turns to his left. He goes uphill a little bit. I'm taking photographs of trees, the tops of trees, because I know Sasquatch climbs trees. I am walking up and Mike turns to his right and he starts walking down. And I look to my left. There's a super tall pine tree and it has two leaders. Something happened to the main leader. Another branch comes off and that becomes the secondary leader. So it's like has two levels to it, two crazy levels. I'm looking up at this tree. I look down on the side of it and I see what we would call a stacked rock or a rock structure. And I said, Mike, did you see these rocks? He goes, what? I said, Mike, you need to come back over there. So he turns around and looks at me and I'm pointing to this rock. I said, look at this rock. And he said, what? And he comes over and I said, you see how there's a flat rock? He goes, yeah. And then there's a rock on top of it. It's on its edge and it's been broken into a triangle. It actually looks like an isosceles triangle. And I was like, look at the shape of that triangle. That's weird. And he's like, oh yeah. And so he goes walking back. My video camera is running on my head. I start setting my camera, like I'm going through the camera settings and I stopped because I'm hearing movement to my left. And there's all kinds of big, thick bushes to my left. There are bushes in front of us to like just beyond Mike and kind of goes around Mike. He's climbing up a little bit underneath this pine tree, standing up and he's listening. And he looks to his left a couple of times and he said, Patrick, we're being stalked. And I said, yeah, I know there's something to my left back here. I can hear it. And he's like, well, no, there's something going around it, growing around where I'm at. And he can hear it. He can hear like it's sneaking around like it's on purpose. It's trying to get an advantage point. Behind me, I can still hear it. I keep looking back behind me, looking to see what this is. And I'm like, whatever it is, they're trying to get close. At that moment in time, this odor happens, right? So here's this stinky, smelly, garbage, nasty, dog, wet smelling yuck that just came out of nowhere. And I know that if that odor happens, there's a Sasquatch within a 30 foot diameter of that spot of where I'm standing. So either 30 feet above me, 30 feet around me, they're somewhere nearby. And I said, Mike, do you smell that? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, they're close. And so I started going through my camera settings and I took it like a step or two back and I'm thinking the tree right in front of me. So I get the camera set up, I get it set to the 32 millimeter focal lens. I aim the camera straight up into the tree and I take like a couple shots, click, click, click. I take these shots into the tree. I bring back down. I'm kind of looking at it. I aim back up. I take another photograph. I'm like, all right, whatever is up there, I hope I got it. The camera I'm using is a 4K Lumix Panasonic digital DSLR. It can go from 25 millimeters to 3,200 millimeter filming distance. So I can see things on a mountaintop and film it from being down in the low lying areas. So I'm like, okay, so if I caught that, I hope I got a good shot on it. Mike comes walking back down and, and the, the smell just goes away. And I'm kind of looking at it. I don't see what I'm supposed to be seeing right off. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I ended up just saving it, turned off the camera, and we wandered on down the trail. We get all the way down to where this three-star point is. I take pictures of that thing, turn around, we're talking about it. He tells me that he and Scott had shown up sometime before we went down there. Like he brought him out here with a few other people. Now I didn't know who he brought, but he brought other people out in the area. They hiked down this one trail here and he goes, there is so much debris there. You can't get past it. I said, really, really? So he's staying there. I walked down that trail and he's right. There was all kinds of like someone brought in tree trunks, all kinds of stuff and just packed it back in that corner. And I thought, that's really weird. I kind of like looked at it. I didn't take any pictures of it. Walk back and I said, Did you go down this way? And he goes, Yeah, we crossed the river. We hiked around. It takes you all the way back into these mountains. I'm like, Oh, that's cool. He goes, Yeah, but I, I don't want to hike that now. I said, Okay. So we ended up hiking all the way back. We get back to the campsite. He's like, Well, you know, we're going to leave tomorrow. I said, No, that's fine. We weren't really filling a whole bunch of stuff. So I get back. We eat our meals. We go to sleep. Come morning, I'm starting to wake up. The sun is baking the tent. I've got my left foot out and it's actually touching the side of the tent. And I'm just laying there. I'm slowly waking up out of REM sleep. And I hear the sound that's like somebody's got their hand at the top of my teepee at that tent, right? It's, it's coming down. And I'm thinking, oh, Mike's going to scream when that sucker hits him. That's what I'm thinking. 
Well, as it comes down, my foot is up against that tent, right? And I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, and I went, yeah! I just started screaming. I was in so much pain. I looked at my foot, and there was a big old red mark across my foot. And I'm like, what? I was like, that can't be right. And so I swing around. I'm in a seated position on my cat. I'm looking at my foot. Mike wakes up and goes, Patrick, what's wrong? And I said, dude, I got hit. He goes, what do you mean? And I said, I got hit. He goes, how'd you get hit? And I said, look at my foot. And I'm pointing to my left foot. And there's this big red mark going across my foot. And it's becoming well known that I got hit. And I was like, oh, the heck with this. So I get up. I throw on shorts. I throw on my socks and shoes, my T-shirt. I grab my camera. And then he's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm going out. And he goes, no, 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 no. Stay in here. I said, no, Mike, you didn't get hit. Let me go out and deal with this. So I unzipped the tent. I got three doors to get out. I had to unzip all three doors. I zipped Mike back inside the tent. I came outside and I yelled, where are you? Show yourself. I want to see you now. I'm tired of this. Show yourself. Silence. As I start looking around, I see two crows. And those two crows are flying around. They're circling our campsite. And then Mike said, what is that sound? And I said, there's two crows above us. What are they doing? And I said, they're circling the campsite. And he's like, really? And I said, yeah. And I was like, do you see anything? And I went, no, I don't know where they went. I don't know if they ran off into the shrubs. I don't know if they went down into the ravine. I don't know where they are. This annoys me. And my foot was beginning to throb. And I was like, oh, this is so wrong. I'm like, all right, I don't, why would they hit me? That doesn't make any sense for them to hit me. But then I started to think about it. I don't think this was a retaliatory hit. I think this was a Get up. Time for you to get up. You need to get out of that thing. Come out here and hang out with us. And that's the feeling I started getting off of this, that this was not an attack on me. This was a get up, get out of the tent, come visit. I'm sitting there watching the crows and the crows kind of start to drop down back behind like this berm. And so I go, you know, I'm going to go follow these birds. And I go walking out towards where I can see them coming, dropping down. I step over this little berm to the right of like where the tent is sitting up against there's a little berm and it goes down into this long deep ravine so i step over it and i start cross-stepping my feet like side by side going down and i stop because i can see the birds coming down and i hear them going and they land and i can see them through the trees i'm like okay they're on a brown looking branch i said okay so i go through the settings going through my camera settings now, if I leave the camera on a standard setting, the 25 to 400 millimeter basic setup, if I try to shoot through those trees, the camera will automatically choose the closest target and focus in on that. So it could be trees and branches and sticks and leaves, bugs, whatever. It will not necessarily be the birds and whatever else the birds are hanging around with. So I turn on the digital settings and I go through it, get it set up to the 3200 millimeter mark, and I aim it down through the trees. I can see one of the birds. So I start to tap on it to focus the bird. And I see that bird. And I can see that he's sitting on this weird looking branch. I'm like, okay, that's weird. So I see him going, bark, 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 bark. and I can hear the other birds re- respond. Bark, 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 bark. And I'm like, okay, well, that's weird. They're talking to each other. That's interesting. So I'm tapping it, trying to get these two birds into focus. And I finally get that done. And then I hear, bark, 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 bark. And then I hear, I'm like, wait a second, what's that? So I start tapping, I start looking deeper at this, and I notice that there's this mound sitting just beyond the birds. And I'm like, what is that? And so I start to focus that. And now I get the two birds and a face come into play. The face looks like Chewbacca from Star Wars. It's freaky. And he's blah, 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 blah. And he's just talking away to the one bird. And he turns and looks at the other bird. He's doing the whole thing. The conversation's there. I'm watching this through my camera going, oh, I need, I need to take a picture of this. So just as I'm getting ready to take the picture, Mike runs out of the tent and he yells, Patrick! And of course, that startles me. And I hit the camera upright. I lose the frame where he was at. So I have to zoom out, zoom back in, get back into that shot. And I'm like, shut up, Mike, shut up, shut up, shut up. And Mike comes up, Patrick! I'm like, Mike, shut up. You need to stop yelling. I was like, you're, you're spooking me here. And so I'm trying to get this shot now. And Mike comes up to the edge of the berm. And I and I'm literally 12 to 15 feet from Mike. And I'm sitting there looking right down the thing. I got him focused in. It's all ready to go. And he goes, Patrick! Yelling in my ear. And I went, Mike, shut up. 
at that moment, the birds take off flying and he looks up and goes, oh, look at the birds. And I'm like, oh, no. And at that, I could see the guy looking at me through the trees and he had this shocked look like, oh, oh, no. And he turned and he was gone. You could hear him stepping every 10 feet. Bang, 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 going down the hill. And I was like, Mike, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I didn't know you were there. I said, Mike. Don't run out yelling my name. Don't do that. And he goes, why didn't what happened to you? I said, you can't do that. I was filming something here. And he's like, did you get it? I went, no. Somebody was yelling, Patrick. So I was like, oh, this is so wrong. And so I ended up going back up the hill. And I said, are we done? And he goes, yeah. He goes, we just got to tear down your tent. We'll go. And I said, okay. So we pull everything out of the tent. We start tearing down everything. And Mike is sitting on the tailgate part of my vehicle. So he's just sitting there talking and I'm wrapping up my tent, rolling it up, getting it all put in there. He goes, I'd love to help you, but I don't know how you do it. And I said, don't worry about it. I'm still blown away that he basically caused me to lose this crazy cool shot. And I'm like, oh, and he goes, I'm really sorry for scaring you. You know, and, you know, and I said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So as I'm rolling up the tent now, he says, look at the size of that footprint. I said, what are you looking at? He said, it's between your, your knees. And I stepped back and there was a imprint in the ground. And this is right where I got hit. So I said, that's his footprint. He had his hand way up here on the top of this tent. And he came down and he goes, oh, well, now that makes sense where it's positioned. And I said, yeah, he had to get a good, like he was putting all of his weight on his left leg when he made that hit. And he's like, yeah, that's compelling. That's really cool. So we took some basic photographs of it, but you really can't see the print because of the rocks. And the position that I was in was the wrong position. So we had things like, I think Mike's shoe was in the picture and we we're trying to show the, the heel and the feet. You just couldn't see it. I was like, I really don't care at, at this point. I ended up rolling up the bag, getting all stuffed in there. Everything was put away. I said, are you ready to go? He goes, yes. And so we get back into the vehicle. We drive out and we're taking this way out. I kind of discovered and as we're driving through the mountain, so there's one mountain pass, we stop. And I said, look at all these structures. And there's just like 10 or 20 structures, gigantic things. It looked like the loggers had come in, cut out a series of trees and stopped right at where these structures were located. And they were all in a row. And I was like, that is crazy. And so we got out of the car, walked over to it. And we're taking pictures of it, looking at different things, doing knocks. And Mike was doing calls and we got nothing out of it. So I was like, well, you know what? This is neat. So we ended up going back to the car, driving out of there, eventually got back into town and I dropped him off in Parker and I, I ended up going home. But that was the crazy story with Junior. Now, there are other events in and around Colorado that take me to different areas in Colorado with Sir. And I got introduced to different size family groups. I haven't been back to that site with Junior since 2016, I don't know, we tried to go down there 2017, but they were having really bad flooding in 2017 and we never made it back in there. I tried to go back in there by myself once. There was so much snow, I couldn't get my car past certain areas and I didn't want to get stuck. So I never made it back into that area where Gina was located. I know Mike went back in there with a the film crew and some other some members because I got to see the video, but I haven't physically been back into that spot. So that might be a spot that I hit sometime this year, which would be really kind of nice. And I'd take Jim back in there and let him see if he experiences some of these things. So that's the end of this story. And hopefully I will talk about another event that happened with a good size grouping of Sasquatch at a different location that is more near the Wyoming border. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the plow. And the five string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's 8-track It's become an 
finally been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking a bales to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it And I hear the front porch breaking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah In the tremolo Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music The pace of the city life drives me wild The only tune is the cars rushing by the stereo's booming When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Some make all the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the tremor on Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out Sweet tea, kind of sound.